Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. A nostalgic look back at our favorite Rangers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm Tom Browning, along with my co-host Rob Berger. We can be heard on Google Play, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and of course, our website at GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson.com. That's GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. Please check it out. You can capture all of our episodes on our webpage. You can contact us by just clicking on the contact bar. You can leave a message. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear about the players that you would like for us to profile. Love to hear about maybe some of the seasons other than the 60s, 70s, and 80s that really made an impact on you as a fan. Again, we will be going off the menu every once in a while. We'll be talking about the current day New York Rangers, the state of the franchise. And again, we love to talk about previous playoff games, impactful trades that took place in New York Rangers history. So wherever you listen to us, please hit subscribe. It's free. So without further ado, here are your hosts, Tom Browning and Rob Berger. Welcome to another edition of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm Tom Browning, along with my great friend and co-host, Rob Berger. Rob, how are you doing today, bud? I'm doing great. Trade deadline has passed. We know what the Rangers will be doing for the next month or so and what they won't be doing in the spring. Yep. Looking forward to talking about it. Yeah, this is a, kind of a special show for us, uh, going off the menu a little bit. Uh, we are going to be recapping the trade NHL trade deadline. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about. We'll touch on other trades, too, that affected other uh, teams in the National Hockey League and uh, the implications and the ramifications of those particular moves. So, Rob, why don't we get started on, I guess, on the Ranger moves. Uh, quite a few, although actually not quite as many as I thought. I thought the Rangers might have been in play to move a couple of other players from the roster, but... What were your impressions of the moves that Jeff Gordon made uh, yesterday at the trade deadline? I, I think if you, you know, really not just yesterday, but the whole trade deadline season, if you will, mm-hmm. the past week, uh, as we've moved into this new world where trades happen not just a day of. I'm sure the TV stations hate that, um, but I think this is one of his best deadlines yet. I know we really didn't give our we haven't talked before this to see what each other thought. Uh, I thought he did really well. I thought the Kevin Hayes trade. Uh, was exceptional, um, especially if you look at what Ottawa got for Mark Stone. Uh, I think the Rangers got a got an excellent haul for for Kevin Hayes from Winnipeg. Uh, you know, getting Brendan Lemieux and um, you know and picks, um, I think is excellent. Yeah, I agree. I think considering that Hayes was a free agent at the end of the year, they were limited as far as leverage goes, obviously, but. Yeah, they got a number one from Winnipeg. Chances are it's going to be almost like a number two if Winnipeg goes as far as the experts think, but it's still a number one. They got a bottom six forward, I guess, in Lemieux, who, uh, if he's anything like his dad, will be a much-needed piece for the New York Rangers, who are always hungry for more physicality, more physical players. But yeah, he's a rental, right? Maybe for Winnipeg. Good chance Rangers were not going to sign him anyway, so it was probably the best deal that Gorton made. Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, I think, you know, you talked about less players not coming through in trades. You know, once once Hayes and Zuccarello are gone, and we'll talk about Zuccarello in a minute, the trade market, I think, for the Rangers closes down, right? Um, but, you know, granted, the, the first-round pick from Winnipeg will be the bottom of, of the drafts, presumably. So, I mean, I think now with the moves that Winnipeg made, uh, where they're going – they're shooing for at least the, the bottom four of the Western Conference, maybe even returning to the Western Conference final. So getting a first for him, and then we should talk about Matt Zuccarello, which was a real shame to see him go. Yeah, um, more of a shame for him to see him get hurt right away. Yep, he'll be out for almost a month uh, with Dallas. What did you think about the, the Zuccarello trade? Well, you know, <laughs> Zuc is a funny guy. I mean, where was he the last three years? You know, Zuccarello had a tremendous month of, well, a month and a half, really, January and February. But where was he the last two or three years? I mean, he was, his claim to fame, if you will, was the the feisty, aggressive, skilled winger, right winger. Not necessarily a goal scorer, but 
a playmaker, a guy that sets up his center iceman and his left wing. You know, for a large part of the beginning of his career with the Rangers, he was just that. But for the last two or three years, you didn't see that type of Zuccarello. And he wasn't hurt. Now, I know he had that traumatic brain injury a couple of years ago. And obviously, that was probably something that took him a real long time to get back from. But it almost seemed like a light switch went on after he had a couple of chats with David Quinn. But he didn't bring that same element to the team at least for the last two, two and a half seasons. And I would have liked to have seen Zuccarello play that way for the New York Rangers over the last couple of years, like he showed in the last month and a half. Would he still be a Ranger today if that was the case? What was Jeff Gorton thinking? Was he thinking that what we saw from Zuccarello the last six weeks, is that sustainable? Is that something that he would bring to the table again next year? What's his motivation right now? He's 31 years old. I thought that his d- diminutive size, his, his smallish size, really worked against him once the playoffs clicked. He never really performed, other than the first couple of years he was with the club, he got lost once the playoffs, once time and space got really, really compromised, you know, really got tight. And I just don't know what his, you know, what value he would have brought to the Rangers if they kept him. But what did they get from it for him? They got a, a couple of assets that may or may not lead to first round picks, which I don't, I think it's a long shot, Rob, whether they're Dallas is going to sign him now that he's hurt or whether Dallas is going to get by two rounds. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I I don't see Dallas going far in the playoffs. I, I, you know, I, it is, you know, it's only one game. That's a pretty small sample size, but in that game, you know, he was skating with Tyler Sagan in that game. And I, I don't know how they see him fitting in on a line like that. You know, I, you know, what, what were our expectations for Matt Zuccarello? His, you know, his best year was 2016 when, when he put up 26 goals. But that's the only time he's ever scored that many goals. Um, he's never been close to an all-star. He had had one year, you know, he, he got some votes for the Selkie. He's gotten votes for Lady Bing. Um, but I, I've always felt, you know, especially as a little more of an outsider uh, from a Ranger perspective, is that the, the appreciation for Matt Zuccarello had more to do with um, his energy and then the ice – some of his playoff moments, you know, the game seven goal, you know, that really, you know, coming back from the injury that really endeared him to the fans. Yep. And I think if you look at Zuccarello uh, objectively from the outside, I mean, you know, where does he, is he that great of a player? I mean, what, I can't imagine what kind of money he's going to demand uh, this off season, how, and how many years he's going to ask for already, you know, he's 31 years old. Uh, so, you know, even though they didn't get much for him, I think it, w- it was the right move to trade Matt Zuccarello, despite, despite how hard Henry McLunquist took it. I don't know if you saw his, for those that didn't see, he gave a, an interview in the locker room where he got pretty choked up talking about Zuccarello uh, leaving the team. Yeah, I saw that. I break down emotionally like that when I keep on seeing Lundqvist giving up the last goal and goals in overtime and everything else. Uh, that's when I start crying. They should have moved that guy too, but we'll get into that in a second. But with Zuccarello, he was a fan favorite because he's he's an underdog. He's a smallish guy who worked hard. You know, Ranger fans get very emotional once they fall in love with you. It's almost like Eli Manning with the Giants. You know, once once New York fans fall in love with the player, they tend to overrate that player. And with Zuccarello, I don't think he had the same. He was rec- not recognized as that of an elite player outside of the New York Rangers area or the you know the the city of New York. Uh, scouts didn't think much. As a matter of fact, the scouts uh, were actually saying up until the trade deadline that scouts don't think much of Zuccarello as being an elite talent, you know, and I think that's true. I think the Rangers got what they could for him. I mean, it'll be amazing if Dallas signs him right now after being getting hurt, missing four weeks. I think that's the longest of long shots. And like you said, Dallas, I don't think is real is, is a threat to go more than a round or two. If they go two rounds, they get a first rounder, but I don't think that's the expectation. So I think Gorton got what he could for Zuccarello. I think Gorton got what he could for Hayes. Uh, and you're right. they should have Both of those guys should have been moved. I really do think that those were two appropriate pieces that, um, that should have been moved. The guy that I think had a lot of value for the Rangers, and I think unless they can sign him again in the summertime, is McQuaid. McQuaid brought a toughness to the New York Rangers blue line that they haven't had in years. And he was instrumental in Brady Shea really elevating his game after having a year and a half of a slump with the Rangers. And um, because he gave his teammates the time and space that they need. And I think he's going to be missed. I think the young players are going to miss that protection that McQuaid provided the Rangers. And McQuaid is a good, solid 
fifth, sixth defenseman. He demonstrated that with the Bruins. He's won a Stanley Cup. The Rangers haven't had a guy like McQuaid in forever. And I think uh, the Rangers are going to have to somehow get a player like that. Not a goon, but they're going to need to get a defenseman who's hard-nosed, who's nasty, who knows how to play the game, both on the defensive side and on the forward side. And maybe uh, Lemieux will bring that element to the Rangers uh, from a forward standpoint. But I would have liked to have seen McQuaid stay. But if he can come back to the Rangers during the summertime, or if they can make a move for a similar type player, I think that's very, very important. So I don't know what your thoughts are, but it seems like they just got back from McQuaid what they spent to get him in the first place. I think a fourth and a seventh rounder. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I think you're right with McQuaid. I, I think there's a good chance he comes back. Um, I think the only way he, he doesn't come back is if he somehow puts together an amazing run uh, to the end of the season or a, a great playoff run and all of a sudden everybody wants to throw a ton of money at him. Uh, but, you know, he's a big defenseman. Again, here we are again where the Rangers' defense, and you talked about toughness. I know, I know you love talking about that. Without McQuaid, I see a big hole, and I don't know who they're going to bring in in the offseason if they don't bring McQuaid back because you know, I, don't, I don't see them spending a lot of money on the, on the defense. Uh, Brady Shea's already making a ton of money. You still have, after this show, two more years of Shattenkirk, two more years of Stahl, two more years of Brendan Smith at big contracts. Um, a lot bigger, bigger than anything you have on offense right now. And none of those guys are going to be your guys, that, you know, your big tough defensemen. No, you know. Yeah, I agree. And if and if anything, you, you, the 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 name of that so many at least fans of teams. I don't know about front offices, but you know, you look on social media. So many fans wanted their team to get Adam McQuaid. Uh, they felt this was the piece our team is missing for the postseason. Um, I, I think he's going to be a great fit in Columbus. Yeah, I agree. I think Columbus is really, we'll, we'll segue to Columbus in a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right. I think uh, Toronto was in play. I think Tampa Bay had shown some interest. And I, I could see the Bruins bringing him back next next summer. I could see where uh, Boston is going to be a very attractive possibility for Adam McQuaid, uh, not just the Rangers. And I fear that, uh, obviously, he's got uh, more of a history with the Bruins. I could see that happening as, as a potential uh, roadblock for Jeff Gordon if he is interested in bringing back uh, McQuaid. You're right. I mean, Smith... Is a physical player, but you know he's been jerked around a little bit by uh, by Quinn. Although I have to say, disclaimer: I think David Quinn is an outstanding uh, hockey coach, and I think the Rangers are very blessed to have him. I really do. I think he's bringing the right mindset to this team. He realizes and he preaches toughness, which no other Ranger coach cho- coach, excuse me, has done in a real long time. You know, he grew up around the Bruins. Uh, he's a real advocate of the Bruins style of hockey, and I think the Rangers could do a lot worse than b- having a guy like that. Uh, provide that type of culture, you know, with the New York Rangers, with the youngsters that they have right now. But Brendan Smith, if he plays, he could bring that element of toughness. Chris Kreider should definitely be that type of player because if he did, I think he would be one of the elite players in the National Hockey League if he utilized his size and speed. And if he protected his teammates more, he could be that uh, Milan Lucic with speed type of player. And he would just be unstoppable. He would be one of the most valuable players in the National Hockey League. If he had that drive, he had that willingness to defend his teammates, but but he doesn't have it. It's not in it's not in his DNA. So you're right, Rob. They they're going to need to do that during the draft. Find two way hockey players, young, big, strong kids, which they have not had the willingness to do. Some Western, you know, Western Canadian kids that can play the game and be tough uh, when they when it comes to the draft or trades this particular summer, this this upcoming summer. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to talk about a team that did it right. Columbus Blue Jackets. Yep. Um, the only, you know, the only surprise I had for them, and you know, I actually talked to a couple of Ranger fans yesterday who said maybe Artemi Panarin could be a Ranger next season. Um, can, I, I'm surprised he didn't move. Uh, the message coming out of Columbus is they need to win the Stanley Cup this year. I guess they're going for it. They're going for it. The, I mean, this is it. You know how successful that is. I was looking back. I mean, how many teams? have made moves that have been so, you know, really successful with, you know, outside of course of the 1994 New York Rangers. And we could debate that whether or not those trade, you know, how important those trades were, but where teams just really go all in, make a ton of moves and win the cups, you know, the Kings made, move, you know, made a move here and there when they won. And we could talk about Marion Hossa moving at the deadline a few times, um, and hit, you know, um, but man, 
the, the Blue Jackets added players, and they kept, kept Panarin and Bobrovsky, both UFAs in the offseason. Rob, you're right. They're going for it. I mean, they got the Zingle. They got Duchesne, right? I mean, they got, uh, you know, McQuaid. Uh, they're a hard-nosed team to begin with. Uh, they kept Panarin, uh, Bobrovsky. They're going for it. You know, what? I guess what they're trying to do is if they can win a Stanley Cup or come darn close, maybe that entices Panarin and Bobrovsky to rethink, you know, what they want to do and maybe re-up with the Columbus Blue Jackets. I think... They feel that some of their uh, guys like Panarin and Bobrovsky are frustrated that they keep keep on getting eliminated in the first first or second round. And I think their goal is to just let it all go and ride it and see if they can win in, in the hopes of retaining some of these guys. Um, Panarin is he gonna is he gonna go to a high tax state like New York and join a building team, a rebuilding team like the New York Rangers? I think the Rangers are a long shot right now. I, I would say the Islanders may have a better shot at Panarin. If the Islanders show that they can take it to the next level during the playoffs. I think they're probably more of an opportunity for Panarin than the Rangers are right now. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think uh, I think that's a long shot for the Rangers to get him. But you're right. Columbus has did an outstanding job to really fortify that team for the playoffs. And they're they're a threat. They really are. Yeah, you know, the Islanders are an interesting point because they, they you know on their offense they have they have a lot of people to resign. Yep. Uh, Eberle, who's you know who's already making six million dollars a year. Uh, he's a UFA. Brock Nelson's UFA. Anders Lee, the captain, of the team, unrestricted. Filippolos are unrestricted. Um, Matthew and then Matthew Barzal. You got to think about Barzal still is only you know two more years away from his RFA year. You know what? You know if they're going to give him a bridge. You know if I'm the Islanders, I give him everything right now and just wrap it up. You know, not wait for that bridge year. Um, so it would be interesting where Bobrovsky goes, as, or excuse me, where Panarin goes, and then along with Bobrovsky, um, you know, not a lot, not a lot of goalies will be out in the market. Um, one goalie definitely not in the market will be will be Henrik Lundqvist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I read somewhere that you know no team even attempted to talk to Gordon about Lundqvist. They didn't even try. I think it's pretty obvious now, even if you're, you know, even if you don't have great eyesight, if you're not an analytics guy like I, you know, if you're not a Corsi guy or an analytics guy, if you rely solely on the eye test and your eyesight is failing, I think even those folks now can see that Henrik Lundqvist is not the answer for the New York Rangers. And he well, hasn't been for a while. You know, Rangers, if, have, if they have a strength in their organization, it's their goaltending with young players. But the fact that not not one general manager even tried to, you know, just take a flyer on a discussion with Gordon, who in, then in turn would have a take a flyer and have a discussion with Lundqvist, yeah, I think speaks volumes, okay? So I'll, that's all I'll say about Lundqvist. But I think I've said my piece. There's nothing else you can say about Lundqvist. I mean, he's definitely the second best goaltender in the, on the Rangers right now. I don't care what anybody else says. The kid is playing very well. He keeps them in the game. He's mentally tough. That's where this team is headed, I think, uh, going forward. You know, it's you know, Lundqvist is the second highest paid goaltender in the NHL right now. Oh, yeah, I believe uh, it. And you could argue that he's he, of all – of the primary starting goaltenders in, in the NHL right now, statistically, he's the worst. Um, very, you know, very few. He was got a goals against, you know, goals against over three. Um, his save percentage is just hovering over over nine hundred, which which just does not fly. And at this point, you know, with the amount of money he's making, I don't, I don't, you know, why even play him? Maybe only play him at home to generate excitement and have Georgia play the rest of the games because. And again, we've talked about it, but I'm obviously one of the a much bigger Henrik uh, apologists than you are, um, especially when you talk about his career overall. But uh, th- this is a contract that I don't know what they're going to be able to do with eight and a half million for two more years per per year is a huge albatross hanging over Gordon's head. It always is, and this is a you know I tell you see, even since the last show, this is <laughs> this is a big change for Rob Berger to say what you just said about Lundqvist because uh, you've like you've like you've said you've been an apologist and a big advocate of his, and you know it's just uh, it, it's a big it's a big mess this contract and somehow during the summer they're gonna have to do something he's gonna have to be comfortable playing a backup role it's a lot of money to pay a backup backup goalie i don't know if gordon could convince him to accept the trade i don't know if the rangers have to eat a lot of that salary in order to convince somebody to take a flyer on lundquist next year but i think it would be uh, malpractice for gordon not to at least attempt to move him in some way, shape, or form, uh, because it's just not working for the, for them anymore. You know, it's just it's just not. Now, getting back to the Rangers, I thought that uh, Nemesikov might have been a guy they would move to because he's been playing better, and I thought there might have been a team 
that could have used his skill set where, you know, if you provide the same type of environment that the Tampa Bay Lightning did with some skilled players around him, that he might be able to flourish again from a goal-scoring standpoint. I'm surprised that they didn't, I mean, they may have inquired about him, but they didn't move him. And I thought that Kreider, you're not going to get a higher value for Kreider than right now. And I thought maybe a blockbuster with Kreider to get a young right-handed stud on defense coupled with maybe a a young forward might have been something that Gordon could have pulled off. But those are the only two guys other than those who who was traded that I thought the Rangers may te- may have attempted to move. What, do you, what were your thoughts on that? You know, yeah. You know, I wonder if it impacts, um, you know, the fact that Kratter and Mesikov each have an extra year left on their contract. Um, a lot of these teams, you know, real, you know, especially a lot of teams that are in contention to win, didn't have as much cap space. Um, and, if you know, so making a move for one of those two guys commits you to next season as well. Uh, you know, Kreider also has that no trade clause. So, you know, who knows what happened behind the scene if they asked Kreider to waive that or if he wanted to stay here. I mean, uh, you know, I don't if these guys, you know, we brought it up with some other guys, if guys want to stay here for the rebuild. Um, I don't know if Kreider's one of those guys. I didn't know that Kreider had a no trade. Is that right? Huh. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, that changes everything. I didn't know that he actually earned a no trade. Um, but the fact that he had another an extra year, I thought, would have made him more marketable for a team to take on his, you know, his salary, which isn't, you know, off the charts, that's for sure. I mean, it's a decent salary. But I thought having an extra year would have made him more of a marketable commodity for a team i know the bruins had shown some interest in Kreider. at least that was the, the rumor uh, i'm not sure of other maybe i think nashville was mentioned as a team that also had some interest in him because he you know he's got the size and maybe if he goes to a, an environment that really doesn't accept anything less than physical play that you know they could get that out of him but yeah I, that's uh, that's that's news to me i had no idea he had a no trade well, that that could that could be a you know the reason why the Rangers did not move him. Yeah, go, I'm sorry. along with uh, you know, Shattenkirk has a no modified no trade, no movement clause. Uh, Mark Stahl's no movement. Brendan Smith is no trade. Brendan Smith too. Wow. Holy cow. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, Shattenkirk's another one, but uh, I know there was some talk that maybe teams uh, needing a power play specialist might make a move to Shattenkirk. Maybe Gorton's ego got in the way of that one. Maybe he felt that since that was such a big splash for, for him a couple of years ago that he didn't want to admit defeat on, on Shattenkirk. I don't know. Or maybe there's no interest in him. I don't know. Listen, the Rangers have a lot of work to do, and hopefully these assets will bring some highly talented players into the fold because their minor league system is very weak. There's not a lot of talent still in the minor leagues. You know, despite the, the fact that they've uh, drafted early the last few years, a lot of the kids are still in college or over in the KHL. There isn't a lot of uh, talent you know, in their immediate farm system. So they, they have quite a wor- bit of work to do. This is going to be a longer rebuild. I think this is going to be a lengthy process. They, you know, Next year, it might be Kreider's turn to be the, the piece, the bait. For, for or maybe even Lundqvist, you know those two guys. Um, maybe Zibanejad, but if Zibanejad doesn't replicate this season next year, then he might be a guy that they start considering to be moved as well. But uh, I think this is a several year process. What are your thoughts? This is at least a several year process, and um, over the next two years, the, you know, as of right now, the Rangers have five first round picks uh, and four second uh, four second round picks. A lot of that depends on how poorly the Rangers finish out the season. How high the pick they get this year will impact the, the picks, you know, especially the Winnipeg pick, which is conditional. But they have a lot of picks, um, and they need to build uh, the system. Um, like you said, you know, not a lot in the pipeline. Um, so you know, need to you know use these picks and well. And we could talk about Jeff Gordon's drafting history <laughs> or lack thereof. Um, the Rangers haven't been, you know, you look at this roster, not a lot of homegrown talent on this roster. That that's making a huge impact. No, no, you have. Uh, that's you know, a that's a problem. Yeah, well, you look at Buchnevich; he hasn't really turned into anything. You look at Leah Sanderson; yeah, he's a third line center. He's probably going to be no better than a third line center in the National Hockey League. Uh, he's drafted number seven. You know, the seventh selection in the first round. That that's ridiculous. You know, Hedl; he's 19 years old, but he's been very quiet lately. Uh, you, you know, you don't know. I don't know why they're playing him at wing. I think he's a center iceman. You know, there's nothing more valuable than a than a big, strong, skilled, highly skilled center iceman in the league. You know, I think he needs to play center. But you're right. Uh, Kraft's off. We don't know yet. We'll see what happens next year. Yeah, Jeff Gordon's uh, drafting history has been, um, 
he was he was far better with the Bruins than he was with the Rangers, and let's hope he can bring some magic uh, to the table. You know, this coming spring or summer, you gotta wonder about you know the the Rangers scouting system. They're up to the task now. Maybe they need to make some changes there. Gordy Clark has had his shot, you know, and he hasn't done much as director of scouting for the New York Rangers. He didn't do much with the New York Islanders. He was there for a long time too, and his uh, selections with the Islanders weren't much better. So I don't know. You know, you're right. It, it's been a very uh, mediocre highly checkered uh, draft history. Anything to wrap up on the Rangers? I'd like to just spend a few minutes on the rest of the league. Anything on uh, the Rangers? You, you know, I, I think I think we hit all, on all of it. As good as the trade deadline day was, you know, I think it's nice to say, you, know, you see different sites that give the Rangers an A or an A minus, B plus, what have you. It kind of underscores uh, what the future will be, though, for the next few years. And I hope this is a commitment for the Rangers that they don't end up a franchise like Calgary or Edmonton. That's always, you know, that, well, maybe Edmonton's a bad example, but Calgary is a perfect example of an organization that's always, you know, never bottom three, but always lingering around that last playoff spot, never truly commits to the rebuild. Hopefully now this is, a, you know, a message from the Rangers that uh, we're looking to, we have a five-year plan uh, to make this team a top team in the NHL. Uh, similar to what Winnipeg did, kind of the path that Buffalo is on right now. You know, trust the process, if you will. Sorry to abuse that expression, um, but committed to winning in the future and not just a first round playoff series. I have not seen the Rangers attack their rebuild like this since the late 1960s when Emo Francis was the GM. It's been that long since the Rangers have, so far, they've been disciplined. They sent that letter out a year ago. They stuck to it last spring with the trades they made and the draft. I don't know how good the draft is going to turn out, but they, they, they drafted players that they feel are valuable uh, additions to the future. They did it again this year with Zuccarello, Hayes, and McQuaid. And if they keep on keeping on, if they keep on staying focused and commit to it and stay with it, then it'll – It'll be like they did back in the 60s when they drafted the likes of Kachuk and Fairburn and Park and, you know, Donnie Murdoch in the early to mid-70s, Steve Vickers, um, you know, those types of players. You know, it's been that long. It's been that many decades since Ricky Middleton. There's been that many decades since the Rangers have done what they're doing right now. And it worked out for them. But they have to make the right selections. They have to, you know, they have to do it right. But listen, Calgary is now one of the top teams in the National Hockey League, so it's working for them. Edmonton, you can argue that their GM was not the right fit, was not the right person. Hey, there's no guarantees, right, Rob? I mean, they could do this, and they could be doing this again for the next three or four or five years and getting it wrong. They weren't going anywhere with the players they had before. They were never going to win a Stanley Cup with the players that they had before. Oh, absolutely not. And I and I'll, I'll remain optimistic that this is, like yep. you said, a, a finally a true rebuild for the Rangers. Yeah, it's going to be painful, but you know, no pain, no gain. I really am willing to go with the pain right now. I know I know a lot of Ranger fans aren't, but you know, I think the the true Ranger fans are willing to um, to take the pain start to develop uh, a nice relationship with the young kids, uh, embrace them, encourage them, root for them. And let's hope, let's hope it starts uh, paying dividends. Uh, how about around the league? You know, what are some of your thoughts about, you know, we talked about Columbus. How about the Nyquist trade and your old boy Tanner Pearson going to Vancouver and Marcus Johansson going to the Bruins and uh, Simmons going to Nashville? What were your thoughts about some of those moves? I think, I think San Jose, uh, they might be the class of the West yep. right now. I would think with that trade, I mean, wow, adding Nyquist, they have a lot of scoring um, already with a great D. I mean, I think we've hit on before their, their, trouble, their troubles in net. Um, I think they'll be okay. Uh, there wasn't, you know, the only, you know, the only thing out there was Bobrovsky, but then, but San Jose is not, a, you know, they're not, that would be, that would have been a weird, weird move. Both teams, you know, really didn't have the assets to flip for that. Um, Nashville did a great job. Um you know the Flyers are another team. You know I, I, I'm conf- I don't know where the Flyers are. Um, you know they're not going to make the playoffs this season. They finally have themselves a goaltender uh, in Carter Hart, even though he's a little banged up right now. Um, classic Flyers. They played him three three out of four games right before their outdoor game, and he gets hurt. <laughs> um, so they have to go with Brian Elliott in their outdoor game instead of, <laughs> instead of the future. Their you know their biggest goaltending prospect in a long time. At one point. Won eight games in a row. Um, yeah, but Nashville did great. I think Ottawa would do great. I think you want to talk about teams that need to rebuild. Uh, other than poor Cody Cece, who's got to stay there now. 
they got rid of every they got rid of everybody um you know the only thing i you know and, and they got a great prospect um i'm surprised they didn't get a number one pick from vegas uh for mark stone um that being said they did get a top prospect um so so good for them um despite marcus johansson uh, disappointed in the bruins we're not disappointed you know not i can't stand the bruins uh, but I don't think they they did very well. They they get they get Charlie Coyle and Marcus Johansson, but um, they did have to give up Ryan Donato. Yep. Um, you know I I don't I don't see this doing anything for the Bruins. You know in the East, you know I I don't think they're better than the Islanders. I don't think they're better than the Capitals. I don't think they're better than Toronto, um, regardless of what the standings say. Um, yeah. What, what are yeah, your thoughts? Yeah, I think you know I was surprised at how. Because of the anticipation, this is two years in a row now, and I think la- this year, even more than last year, I was surprised at how few big names were moved. I thought there might be more blockbusters like the Ranger Tampa thing last year. I thought there would be more multiplayer trades, more blockbusters. Uh, so many teams are in contention. Newer teams are in contention this year that hadn't been there in a while, like Calgary, for example. I thought there would have been more big name moves, so I was surprised about that. Um, I, I agree. I think Nashville did a great job. I think Ottawa got, has a lot of assets now to make moves, but do they have the management team in place to capitalize on those moves? They really have cleared house. They got you know everything is you know they're clean now, right? Uh, he's a CC is a different story. He's he, he's languishing behind, but you know Mark Stone uh, is he a does she, a first round worthy. I, you know, he's he's got good hands. He's a good goal scorer. I don't know if he's a first round talent, but maybe he is. I mean, we got a first rounder for Hayes. Could you have gotten a first rounder for Stone? Uh, possibly. You know, Broussard got moved again. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, second time in a month he's been moved. Uh, so I think his his reputation has taken a big hit. You know, as far as um, you know, Montour went to Buffalo. I think Montour's got. You know, he's got some. He's got a good future ahead of him. I think he's a talented young player. But yeah, I think that's kind of my, you know, Nyquist, you know, going to San Jose, I think is a huge move for San I think you're right. I think San Jose could be the team to beat, not just in the West, but for the Stanley Cup. I think uh, what team has as much seasoned veteran depth than San Jose right now? I don't know. Nobody does. Um, you know, if I was to, you know, put money on a team winning, um, if I was to drive down to Jersey and make a bet, uh, it would be on San Jose right now with with you know with Nashville now not far behind you, you know we have the opposite spectrum of what we're talking about today and that's that's the Tampa Bay Lightning you know you know currently at 100 points um they're going to cl- get that president's trophy real soon uh what a year they're having right um won nine in a row i mean just just yeah just an unreal team i think you know they didn't they didn't do anything they don't have to or anything significant yeah they don't have to um this is so um you know, you see both sides. You know, that's I guess that's that's the question for the playoffs. Did these teams do enough to catch up to Tampa Bay? Well, I would say, and maybe I was a little bit over, maybe a little bit, a little bit of hyperbole with San Jose. I have to say, I think if San Jose had the goaltending, I would say they're, I would, I would say they're probably the odds-on favorite because of their their DNA. Their San Jose's goaltending, I think, is very average. And I think if Tampa Bay can get, if their goaltending and Tampa Bay plays to their capabilities, I think Tampa Bay should win the Stanley Cup. I think there might be a little bit more mental toughness amongst the the other, you know, the top nine to twelve forwards, the top six defensemen on San Jose. I think they're a little bit more mentally tough, built for the playoffs more than Tampa Bay. You know, Tampa Bay is still a high-flying team, but when time and space becomes more, you know, difficult in the playoffs, I think San Jose is built better. But I think if Tampa Bay's goaltending plays up to their standards, then they should beat San Jose in the Stanley Cup Finals. Exactly. Um, listen, don't count, out, don't count out Washington in the Islanders. I agree. Oh, I can see the Islanders making some – I can see the Islanders being this year's Vegas. I, you know, I tell you – wouldn't it be something if uh, they're a Cinderella team and they go, if not all the way, pretty darn close? I mean, what Trotz and Lamorello have done is just unbelievable. Un- but they're kind of in a similar situation as Columbus because they've got Brock Nelson, like you said, as a free agent, right? You got Anders Lee and you got yep. uh, Eberly. So this is the year that they have to do it if they're going to do it because uh, they could have two or three holes there at the, end of, at the end of the year like Columbus if they don't. 
Although I have more faith in their, on the Islanders' free agents sticking around because of what Lou and Truss have brought to the table than, than Columbus. But yeah, you're right, Rob. I couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more. Any uh, closing thoughts before we um, end the show today? You know, real fast, uh, one of my favorite topics is, is trades that, that never happened. And just thinking of Tampa Bay, one of my, one of my favorite trades that never happened um, that unofficially did happen, just didn't go through. Uh, with the time that the Rangers almost got Steven Stamkos. And the deal was so close to happening that, you know, Glenn Sather actually shook hands um, um, with with Len Barry, who at the time was the co-owner of the Lightning. Uh, I don't know if people remember, but that was a horrible year time when the, the Lightning had Stamkos as a rookie. They hired Barry Melrose, the t- and the team was just a mess. Melrose didn't play Stamkos. Stamkos struggled. And the Rangers offered either uh, Jenny Grabchev, I don't know if people remember him, uh, Dubinsky, Girardi, Callahan, or Michael Delzato, three of those names for Steven Stamkos. And wow, would we be be in a different world if that trade went through? Can you imagine? Wow, that is something. That is, uh, the, the, you're talking, you're right. You, that would be a different world, without a doubt. And it's funny, you mentioned Delzato. He got moved again, too, huh? <laughs> yeah, Delzato again. got moved. Anaheim moved, moved Del, Delzato again. Um, yeah, all, you know, all, all, those, all those Rangers really, you know, never really stayed too long. I mean, Callahan had a, great, had a, had a nice run here right. in New York. Um, and the Rangers are still paying Dan Girardi a million Amazing. a year for, for, for a while. You know, you talk about other trades that happened at the deadline. You know, the, the biggest one the Rangers made, uh, a player that left the team, uh, Hall of Famer Andy Bathgate, when the Rangers traded him in the 60s to Toronto, he scored the cup-winning goal for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Andy Bathgate, of course, was a Hall of Fame player for the Rangers and uh, went on to win a cup with uh, Toronto. And, and I remember the Rangers making a big uh, deadline trade back in 72, the year they played the Boston Bruins in the uh, Stanley Cup Finals. They got Bobby Rousseau, a, po- a power play specialist from the Montreal Canadiens, who did a great job for the Rangers and helped them get to the Stanley Cup Finals uh, the year where Jean Rattel got hurt and they really needed Bobby Rousseau's offense to really fill the gap there. But, um, you know, Pete Stemkowski was a, the player that came to the Rangers after pl- having a great career with the Maple Leafs and winning a couple of cups with Toronto. And thinking back on some of the deadline deals that really helped the New York Rangers, um, that really was significant. I mean, the Rangers made a lot of deadline trades but, of course, 94. I mean, 94 was the epitome of all these mercenaries coming to the New York Rangers around the deadline <laughs> and ha- helping them win a cup. Uh, and we don't need to go into all the players that they, uh, that they brought in from Chicago and Edmonton to make that happen. But uh, other than 1994, you know, the, there hasn't been a lot of guys that made uh, big impacts on the New York Rangers on or about the deadline to really help them uh, in the Stanley Cup playoffs. No, you know, I was looking back through the years, not a lot. You know, again, other than that 94, that 94 season that made an impact. And you can argue, you know, you can look back at all teams that, you know, I, I think the trade deadline has become such a sensationalized idea in every sport where it's almost just, you know, for fans and the media to have something to talk about. But at the end of the day, you know, you're hard pressed to find a team that just made such a difference that at the trade deadline that there was that, those trades that helped them that guarantee them. Right. Help. It's an event now. It's a it's a it's a yeah. big event for sports writers, announcers and podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's really what it's that's really what it's for as far as all the hype and everything else. But uh, any other uh, closing thoughts, Rob, uh, on the trade deadline and uh, the New York Rangers? No. Not much. Um, looking forward to see how this how the end of the season. Absolutely, plays out. we'll see uh, if the Rangers are going to be a uh, a lottery team or if the. It's going to be the L.A. Kings or some of the other clubs that are struggling right now. So, folks, I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, please uh, provide Rob and I with any ideas, suggestions on our website. Look forward to connecting with you all again in March. Uh, on behalf of Rob Berger, this is Tom Browning for the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you for listening. This has been a Go Tommy Boy production. 